All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about improving API performance by utilizing the platform cache. It's definitely a mouthful, but I think it's a really powerful feature and we're gonna dive into things, so buckle up. All right, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Phil Bergner. I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem for about 11 years now. The first few years I worked on the professional services side doing Salesforce implementations. Uh, after that, I pivoted to uh, the product development side where I've been working on some app exchange apps, uh, healthcare focused one, and most recently Eureka. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we do because this is what led me to utilize a platform cache. We're going looking at some benchmark data and some kind of truncated code that, that we utilize for the platform cache. So I think this is important background. Um, we're a Salesforce native mobile workforce solution for guided procedures, processes, and collect data offline. So we work a lot with field service teams. And I want to focus on that even offline part because that's the most critical part. Because just like Salesforce field service mobile app, Salesforce mobile app, we utilize a briefcase model. So the idea there is that if I'm a field service tech and I'm getting ready to go out in the field, I'm gonna need all my data prime before I go, right? So I may have no connectivity, intermittent connectivity, not really sure, so I need to have all that data available just in case I need it. So they'll be syncing data like work orders, accounts, work order line items, service appointments, product catalogs. So we have customers that are syncing over 100,000 records just for a single day, just because they're not sure exactly what they're gonna need. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty memory intensive, time intensive process. And then you're talking about a mobile device, connectivity speeds. Um, we really are trying to optimize it as much as possible. And that's what led us to explore the platform cache, trying to eke out every little bit of performance we can. So what is the Lightning Platform Cache? It provides faster performance. It is a cache layer. Really, the idea is there you can put this data in the cache, and then when you retrieve it, it's going to be faster than if you were to do it through traditional methods. So um, for our scenario, that first bullet there, complex data that's time and memory intensive to compile. So for our scenario, we're running about 25 SQL queries and compiling a very large JSON structure that was going to be returned to the end user. Um, so some other scenarios could be data retrieved from an external system. So maybe you have an external billing system. So they're reaching your API, you have to call it to another API and get that data. There's a lot of latency involved there. If you can get retrieve that data and put it in the cache, it's gonna be able to return it a lot faster. And really just identifying any frequently used scenarios where you're running the same process over and over, it's kind of memory intensive, like I've been saying. Um, that's all right for utilizing the platform cache. I think the important consideration there is when it's cached, it's not necessarily live data, right? So that's an important trade-off is performance versus how often is that data changing? How important is it that it's the absolute latest data? All right, so kind of just, you've gone through your process, figured out, oh, you know, I found an area where I might want to utilize the platform cache what are my next steps? So the first thing you want to decide is which type of cache makes sense for your use case. It could either be the session cache, the org cache, or some combination of both. Uh, the session cache is really user-specific data. It's only going to be served for a specific user. So think like user record information, like time zone, preferred currency, stuff like that. And the org cache is really data that's going to be applicable across many users. So for our use case, that's going to be they're out in the field, they're doing things like home health, uh, home health assessments, safety inspection forms, like those forms and that type of data is gonna be accessible for a broad set of users, right? It's not for a specific user. They may be on a different site or capturing different data, but the form itself isn't changing. So that was a perfect example for us to utilize the org cache. Um, one other thing I wanna point out here is that the time to live, it's often abbreviated like TTL in some of the documentation. That's really just the lifespan of that item in the cache. So for the session cache, that's about up to eight hours or whenever the session expires. And for the org cache, you can configure that as well, but it can be up to a maximum of 48 hours. What are some considerations if, for using the cache? One is be safe. I think that's a pretty good development practice in general. Maybe there's some like cowboys who don't believe in that and just go straight to prod. But um, what I'm talking about specifically here are 
there's no guarantee against data loss from the cache, right? It's not a permanent storage solution. So don't put data in the cache, be like, oh, it's good to go. It's going to be there, it's served up quicker, but like we just said, caches expire, that data isn't permanent. You need a persistent storage solution for where you're storing your data. Um, optimize usage. This is a tip from some of the Salesforce documentation, but basically saying it's better to store a few small items than putting a whole lot of small, sorry, it's better to store um, just few large items than a whole bunch of small items. And then the other call out I want to make here is some of the default limits that are available for different org types. Um, the most interesting one for me was the App Exchange apps and getting three megabytes of provider free capacity. For us, that unlocked a lot of functionality because we're an App Exchange app and going into a customer's org, you're not sure what org type they're going to have, how much, data, how much of the cache could be utilized by other App Exchange apps or custom code in their org. So being able to be installed in a subscriber org and getting three megabytes of capacity, we know that we have at least that much. Um, and we can kind of control that ourselves. And if they want to augment that with more, even better. So I want to walk through some of the visualizations and functionality that's available inside Salesforce for managing and uh, diagnostic data for utilizing the platform cache. You see here, this is an example of a cache that's being utilized. You can see here, there's some of this dashboard information for how much of the cache is being utilized. What's the breakdown for what type of uh, cache you're using here? It's all dedicated to that app exchange free capacity. And then partition allocations. You can set up different partitions for the cache for different use cases, right? So if you have 10 megabytes, you could dedicate two to a specific use case and a specific partition, dedicate eight to a different use case, or however you want to break it down. So if you were to click into a specific partition, this is what you would see. In this scenario, we only have one partition, so it's utilizing all of it. And then this, once again, is our metric for how much of the org cache we're currently using. This one is very a little crazy looking, I know. But I just want to show that this visualization is available. Basically, a pie chart breakdown of how your cache is being utilized. I think the next screen is going to be a little bit easier. Um, in the UI, once you scroll down, this is what you're going to see. This is really a breakdown of what's currently in your cache like on a record by record basis. So. Uh, what, the way you work with the cache, you basically put a key, it's a key value pair, or like an apex map, however you want to think of it. You put a record in there, you're going to access it by that key. And here you can see the specific records that have been added to this cache. The namespace that they exist in, whether it's the local namespace or a package namespace. Uh, the size, so this is the size as it exists in the cache. So there is a compression algorithm going on, I don't know exactly what it is, but it does seem to chunk stuff down to like pretty small sizes. So it's probably significantly smaller than you might expect. And then there's some other metrics here too. So the last time it was accessed, the access count, you know, how many times it's been touched. So this is all really useful data to figure out how your cache is being utilized. You can make changes to your code based on, you know, oh, I thought people were gonna be hitting this all the time. They're really not. You can make tweaks and adjustments there. You can also access a good amount of this type of data. Um, some metrics like programmatically as well through like anonymous Apex or if you were to set up a custom dashboard, you can do that as well. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is that you also have the ability to delete individual like purge individual records from the cache here on the, the side column there. You also have the ability on the main screen to just refresh the entire cache. If you just like, hey, I know something significant has changed. I don't want anyone getting stale data. You can come in there and manually push all that data out. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this benchmark scenario that I ran. So this was with our product code. Uh, this is really just an intense use case where I'm a, seal, I'm a safety tech. I'm getting ready to go out in the field. I have to sync 350 templates, 70 forms. And I need all this data available offline, keeping in mind that some of these templates can be over a meg of JSON. So it really is, I wanted to kind of push it to the limits to see, get some really good data for how performance was going to change. Um, and then one thing that my, my preference for like this type of data is I really want it to be production code, not just like demo code that's kind of contrived or isn't a, a really good real world test. So I ran this using our uh, actual product code. And I'm going to walk through kind of a stripped down version of what that looks like in just a few minutes here. All right. So let me hop into that real quick. So if you don't know a lot of Apex, that's OK. I'm going to walk through this a little bit. And then a few minutes later, I'm going to show you a better kind of starting point. But I wanted to work, walk through a really kind of stripped down example of the code that we're running in order to capture some of this benchmark data. 
So you're going to have, in our scenario, a REST endpoint set up. It's in calling this helper class, which is going to query some data. In our scenario, it's templates, but it could easily be work orders, accounts, whatever type of data you have living in the cache. Um, one best practice that we've kind of learned over the years is to utilize a lot of feature flags because you may go into a customer's org like, oh, I'm sure I know how they're going to use it. And you're completely wrong, and they want to use it completely differently, or they want to tweak things based on their specific use case. So uh, we utilize feature flags. One of them here is really just a custom setting that's defining whether they want to utilize the cache at all. So we're making this feature available. They may say, hey, I don't want any chance of like, stale data being served to my customers. You know, they're all on good connections, or we're not syncing a lot of data. We don't want to utilize it at all. It's really just a checkbox where they can come in and turn it on or off. Um, even if you're not working with like, a package, it still can be really useful as kind of a kill switch. So if you were to roll something out, it's production, things are going a little awry, you could just log in, uncheck it, and it was just you could write your code to kind of skip over the cache and just not utilize it at all. Um, so that's what we're checking here with this Boolean. We're saying, is that set? Should we be utilizing the cache? And the other customization we give users is the ability to define the lifespan for items in the cache. So once again, this could be like a customer by customer configuration where um, maybe some are only updating their templates every couple days. Maybe some are hitting all the time. They can determine that lifespan, and we're going to respect that. Um, this is really just a map of the structure that we're going to return to the end user. Um, this is a, we're going to kind of keep track of the templates that we don't find in the cache. So I think this is a really important part of the design pattern is there can be cache misses. There can be data you expect to be in the cache that isn't. You should have a fallback plan set up so that uh, if it's not in the cache, that you're still serving this data up. So we're going to come in here. So we've determined if we should use the cache. If we have, we're going to go ahead and access our partition. That's what we're doing here. We're going to do cache.org.getPartition based on our namespace and retrieve that partition. Then going to iterate through all the IDs that we want. So once again, this could be templates. It could be accounts, whatever you want. We're going to attempt to access that item. And then we're going to determine if we found it or not. So in this scenario, we're just checking if it's not null. If it is, then we found something in the cache. We can go ahead. In this scenario, I'm just deserializing some JSON cast it into the structure that I want, and then put it in my map to return to the end user. So basically, the gist of it is we found it. We're going to put it in our structure, and we're going to, this one's good to go back to the, the API recipient. If it's not found, we're going to keep track of those two. And obviously, if we're not utilizing the cache, then we didn't find any in the cache. So if we didn't, we're going to basically do what we would assume your code would do normally, right? Is like This can be like a helper method. Just go do all the grunt work, all your queries, compile the structures, put them all together. Um, that's what we're kind of abstracting away there. We're going to go ahead and put in our data to return. And then uh, if we're going to go ahead and retrieve this data, we've done all the grunt work. It wasn't previously in the cache. If the cache is enabled, let's put it in there, right? So that time, if this person syncs again, or if the next person's coming online, they need to sync that same data, it's going to be in the cache and good to go. So that's what we're doing with this statement. It's just like a map. You're just going to do a, a put statement. In this scenario, I'm serializing it. And then this last perimeter here is just our lifespan for how long we want this to persist in the cache. Um, one other thing to be aware of is there are a couple of specific exceptions that you may want to handle. Um, you can decide how you want to handle this best for, for your use case. But um, do a try catch, and then like item size limit exceeded. There's a whole list of them in the Apex documentation for other exceptions, and decide how best you want to handle those. And that's it. So then we've, we found it was either in the cache or it wasn't. If it wasn't, we put it there, and we're going to return that to the end user. All right. So I'm going to do a visualization at the end, but I just want to show some of the raw data here. So in this scenario, I ran 12 requests, basically, for some of this data. That's the leftmost column. The start column is the time that the endpoint received the request, right? So I'm trying to exclude all any like mobile latency or anything. This is when the first request hit the server. And then the next column is when the response was sent to the mobile app. And the elapsed is the CPU time usage for like how long that took on the server side. Um, there is a little bit of like our mobile app does a little bit of smart batching here based on like expected payload sizes. That's why the first six, I think, kick off at the same time. But um, we do have some uh, data down here at the bottom. Once again, I'm going to show a visualization of this in a second. but. From start to end, it was 17 seconds from when we received the first request to when the last response was set. 
and then an average CPU usage time of nine seconds. What about with the platform cache? So see here, I ran the exact same tests, um, same similar data, but the start to end time was 12 seconds. The average CPU time was six. So let me just show you a visualization of that real quick. So you can see here that utilizing the cache, it was at least as fast. In some cases, we saved significant amount of time with the cache. I'm gonna go ahead and jump to the conclusion. So from the end user's perspective, the full sync time was reduced by five seconds from 17 to 12. Like I said, we're moving a lot of data back and forth across a mobile connection. But you can imagine if you're a tech, you're at your office, you're at your house, you're ready to go out for the day, you push that button, you're waiting for that green light to come through that you have all your data, every second counts. So it was a pretty significant improvement, I feel like, for um, not very complex code, right? It didn't go back and completely rewrite stuff. I'm just basically trying to access in the cache. If it's not, I'm putting it there. And if not, I'm just going about my code the way it normally would. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is also Per request, we went from 25 queries down to seven. And the only reason we still have that many is because there's some data that we're retrieving always in real time. Stuff like, could be like patient medication data, right? Like you don't want to go out there with stale data. So we still have some data that we're retrieving in real time that we would never want to serve from the cache. And the average CPU time was reduced by three seconds as well. So if you're familiar with like platform limits for like number of SQL queries, you know, CPU usage too, you're also buying yourself a little bit more breathing room depending on how close you are to hitting those limits already. So like I said earlier, I wanna show just a simpler example. Like if you're just getting started, you wanna try something out. Uh, Salesforce has this cache builder interface available and that's what this is an example of. Um, it's really pretty straightforward. This example is really similar to the example they have in their documentation. I just wanted to kind of keep with the theme of retrieving template data just to show uh, kind of how it could work slightly differently. Um, so you can see down at the bottom, this is the usage, right? So this is how you would retrieve data. So using the cache class, you're going to retrieve it. You're telling it what type of data it is. Once again, this could be anything. This could be accounts, could be work orders, and whatever type of data you have in there. And the way it works is the implementation above, when you do that get to retrieve the record, it's going to determine if it's in the cache. If it is, it's gonna serve that up. If it's not, it's gonna run this do load method. You just tell it what you wanna do in order to retrieve that data if it's not in the cache and it will automatically put it in the cache for you. So once again, like depending on how much like fine grained control you want over when you're serving the cache and what data is going into the cache and when, this is a really great starting point. It kind of uh, abstracts that away and says, let me handle if it's in the cache or not. You just write the information, tell me what you wanna do if it's not in the cache and I'll handle where it comes from. Uh, what are some additional considerations? Uh, some of these we already hit on a little bit, but you consider when refreshing data, uh, what type of data is it? How stale can it be? Consider using, like I said, like time to live for the cache or even dynamic refresh options. So like I said, like programmatically, you can go into Apex and say, hey, something changed and using the trigger. And you go, hey, I'm gonna purge this record from the cache. Um, there's a lot of functionality available there for dynamically handling that. And the other one is like I said, like handling cache misses. So if the data isn't in the cache, Make sure your code is set up to handle that scenario. A couple other ones, like I mentioned earlier, the cache data is compressed. Even though it may not seem like a whole lot of space, it might be more than you're expecting. Um, cache visibility is really, if you are in a managed package, you have the ability to set if that cache can be accessed by code outside of your package or not. So if you're in there with custom code, maybe they have code that's gonna interact with the cache as well, you can allow that functionality and also cache eviction and least recently used algorithm. It's basically how it determines if you're at capacity and your cache is full, you go to put something in there, what happens? Um, basically the least recently used item is the one that's pushed out in order to make room for new uh, cache values. All right, so a couple helpful links here. One is I definitely utilized Apex Developers Guide a lot. Trailhead was also super helpful. Um, a lot of good data there to help get you started with the platform cache. All right. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully this was helpful for everyone and got a good chance to get a good understanding of the platform cache and how it works.